Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Back in the year 1915, 164 young cadets looked forward to their graduation from West Point Military Academy on New York's Hudson River. Exactly 40 years later, in the June week of graduation 1955, the historic old academy celebrated the return of one of those cadets, Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States. Our first story on the big picture brings you the highlights of that memorable occasion. In the late spring of the year, in June, West Point is a pleasant place to be. In June, the whole cycle of West Point life comes to its fruition. June week means graduation, a new crop of officers beginning their Army careers. June week 1955, however, was something more than usual. The Military Academy was welcoming back one of her most distinguished alumni. General Bryan, superintendent of the Academy, made the introduction. I am very honored to present the President of the United States. Sixty-four cadets who through four West Point years had eagerly looked forward just as you of this class have done to the moment of graduation. Actually we thought of it as liberation but uh, 40 busy years have somewhat changed that youthful viewpoint. 40 busy years. The face of the world itself has altered greatly in that time. Yet the face of West Point remains much the same. A president named Eisenhower will remember this room. It hasn't changed much since the days when a cadet named Eisenhower lived and studied here. Yes, Cadet Eisenhower, many things are the same. The shaded paths of flirtation walk and a pretty girl in a summer dress still form one of the most pleasant memories a cadet holds of June week. Kissing Rock still provides a pleasant excuse, if you need one. And the Hudson, broad and placid, adds to the sense of relaxation after a tough academic year. On a Saturday evening, the graduating cadet will go with his lady to the hop in Cullum Hall. The next morning at Battle Monument, you'll find cadets standing attentively at religious services. For those about to graduate, it has an added meaning, as will each thing they do for the last time as cadets this June week. Another tradition is the superintendent's reception for graduating cadets and alumni. The dress styles may have changed, and the uniforms been modernized. But the atmosphere of the superintendent's garden is the same. A pretty girl still lifts a dipper, looking cooler than the punch she serves. Or maybe you'd rather do your relaxing at a dead run. If so, there's a last game of lacrosse on the playing field. It's strictly a man's game, not one to be played half-heartedly. But back to June 1955. 21 guns is the traditional greeting to the chief executive. This is the arrival which made this particular June week something to remember, spotlighting the years which led from plebe to president. Together with the president, members of the corps dating back to the turn of the century gather to honor their alma mater at the statue of Sylvanus Thayer, 
the father of West Point. The famous West Point Choir sings the alma mater. senior living graduate of the academy, General Hodge, returns at the age of 96 to lay the memorial wreath. After the ceremonies, the president joined his fellow alumni at luncheon. This hall is packed with my personal friends. My life doesn't have the freedom that it did once that would allow me to search each out and exchange a word as I would like to do. So by according me this privilege, I can say, God bless each one of you. I should like very much to see you and talk to you alone. Meantime, in the area, cadets are making ready for the all-important graduation parade. For the last time, plebes are getting the treatment from upperclassmen. Later today, they'll be yearlings, recognized as having proven themselves. But right now, it's get another wrinkle in that neck, mister. Then at last, the word comes down, and the cadets in traditional full-dress uniform move out to take their positions on the plane. Those who will graduate today move forward together to the position of honor, front and center. It's for them that the rest of the Corps will pass in review, a mark of respect and farewell rooted in long tradition. the last element of the review has passed, the graduation parade is officially entered. in the cadet area, the men who were plebes an hour ago are now yearlings. The time-honored ceremony of recognition makes it official. Glad to have you with us. The high point of the day, however, is still the graduation ceremonies themselves. By the preamble to the Constitution, the common defense, the first mission of the soldier, is elevated to a like rank with the loftiest objectives of men and women united in a free society. Working and living in this spirit, you as soldiers will make yourselves and the Army a professional counterpart of the American way. Stout of faith in yourselves, your alma mater, your country, and your God.
And now, to his graduating class and to each of its members, my congratulations. Good luck. In order of their scholastic standing, the graduating cadets file by. It's taken four years in an act of Congress, but each man is now a commissioned officer in the United States Army. The low man of the class, called the GOAT, gets a special ovation and a private word from his commander-in-chief. As the hall grows quiet, the president has time for a thoughtful look at this new class of 55. You who graduate today will be servants of the civil power, committed to quick obedience. You may someday be responsible for the lives of men, possibly the fate of a campaign. No signal from headquarters will then communicate to you the proper action. The moment will not wait on the completion of a staff study. The arena of decision will be your own mind and conscience, naked of others' counsel. To be ready for that crisis is one mission of the American soldier. From President Eisenhower and the colorful ceremonies of a West Point graduation, the big picture takes you to Kaiserslautern, Germany. The sound of bursting shells across the free countries of Europe has faded into memory. Today, our forces in Europe still maintain a constant vigilance against the event of enemy aggression. Our cameramen have recorded a typical combat unit's preparedness. Soldiers of the 25th Anti-Aircraft Battalion performing a practice alert. It is 0600. The alert call comes through. Part of the realistic training that keynotes today's Army overseas. Upon receipt of the alert call, men and equipment must be moved into defense combat positions within a time limit of two hours, ready for action. At the 25th Anti Aircraft Battalion, the charge of quarters consults the alert plan. From this list, he notifies all personnel residing off post. He then notifies the first sergeant and battalion troops. In a matter of moments, gun crew personnel are pouring out of their billets. The idea is to make every man letter perfect in his combat job, so that if the real call ever comes, the step-by-step -step drill he is now practicing will enable him to respond instantly. In formation, each member of the gun crews is carefully inspected.
The inspecting officer makes sure that every man carries all his equipment. As the alert gets underway, the battalion's activities reflect a keen awareness of its defense responsibilities. Then the march is begun to the motor pool, where vehicles will speed these men to the combat defense area. Meanwhile, at the motor pool, the motor sergeant gives a final briefing to the drivers of jeeps, trucks, and artillery tractors, which will make up the convoy. Collecting their trip tickets, drivers head for their vehicles. Riflemen assigned as guards or to defense positions within the cantonment draw their weapons from the armorer. They take up their stations along with 50 caliber machine guns in place to defend the cantonment. Other machine guns mounted on trucks will join the convoy to the defense area. Ammo cans for each of these weapons are loaded on the same truck. Another truck pulls into position to be loaded with sea rations. There's no telling how long this alert will last. Whether its duration is a matter of hours or days, provision must be made to feed hungry troops. Arriving at the motor pool, the gun crews move up to waiting trucks and tractors, in which they will ride to the defense combat area some distance away from the cantonment. The vehicles are directed into the positions they will take in the convoy. the leading vehicles of the first battery through the gate. With coordinated timing and precision on the part of each unit, the alert is proceeding on schedule. And the convoy is underway. The mission of this anti-aircraft battalion is to maintain combat readiness for protection against hostile air attack. Though they are in Germany, this mission is one that vitally concerns all Americans and free Europeans. For this is one unit in our pattern of protection against destruction from the skies. Vehicles are directed to their predetermined positions in the defense area where weapons will be set up. The command is given to the 90 millimeter gun crew to dismount. Then the crew begins to unhitch the big 90 from the artillery tractor, which serves as a prime mover. Nearby, a portable generator is set up to supply power. Now the sensitive acquisition radar antenna begins to search the sky. A quad 50 machine gun mounted on a truck is emplaced in support of the perimeter defense. As a simulated aggressor air attack approaches, the 90 millimeter gun crew is in formation and on command moves quickly to positions around the gun. Then synchronized with the rotation of the radar antenna, the gun stalks its target in the sky. Every man on duty at the gun site is trained not only to be letter perfect in his own performance, but to know the jobs of all other members of his crew as well. The aggressor aircraft is picked up by the radar. 
and now by the big anti-aircraft gun as shown on its azimuth dial. The command of fire is given. For the practice alert, the weapon is loaded, but firing is simulated. As yet, the men engaged in this training maneuver have not been called on to act in a real alert. However, in order to be ready, if and when the real thing should occur, our overseas troops, wherever they are stationed, hold practice alerts such as this regularly. There is a message for the battery commander. The alert is over. He gives a command, march order. Though we are developing new and more powerful weapons for men, such as these to operate, they do not diminish the importance of the individual fighter in combat. Our generals tell us that our most important military weapon is still the trained soldier, and will be for some time to come. March order completed, the convoy moves out of the defense area for the return to the motor pool. Leaving the trucks, the men of the 25th Anti-Aircraft Battalion who have performed as Europe's Minutemen now gather to hear a critique by the battery commander of the job they have done in the practice alert. We have just completed another in our monthly alerts. During the alert, there were a few comments, a few notes that I'd taken along the route and after we arrived in position. First, as most of you know, these monthly alerts are conducted for one main purpose. And that is, if the real thing should happen, we would be able to move out of here with the least practicable delay, move into position, and be able to deliver quick and accurate fire. In order to do this, it's going to require everyone's cooperation and everybody working rapidly together. Keep in mind that all your equipment must be cleared of this area. Remember, too, that all men must wear all their individual gear. That includes your steel helmet, carrying of your weapon, etc. Remember, once out of the positions, and this is particularly for the drivers, we must maintain 100 yard interval until arriving to our position. The one main comment I have when we moved in position, and that is one of the gun sections was a little slow and becoming operational. I thought the range platoon did quite well, moved in quite rapidly. Also, the machine gun platoon and securing the defense, the perimeter of the battery. Keep in mind that we have two hours in other words, we have a two-hour limit to meet. We must be able to move out of here, get in position, and be able to deliver fire. Are there any questions? There is no question about the big job our Army is doing in building security of peace by preparedness for all free people all over the world. And for our final story, here is another kind of alert. It is a Saturday morning at Fort Myer, Virginia. Fort Myer, Virginia, the military showcase of the nation's capital, where post-military police personify the tradition of spit and polish. To the visitor, these picked men, hey, what's going on around here? Ah, oh, now, buddy, you know about that Davy Crockett business. Why, these days you're nowhere if you haven't got one of them coonskin fedoras there. Well, sir, these troops here all belong to the David Crockett Junior Rifle Club. That's the juniorest junior on the end there. Every Saturday morning, bright and early, they move out down to the Fort Myer firing range and rack up their weapons. That's where they get the word on how to handle a rifle, the safe way. What happened? Some of these kids' daddies took a special instructor's course from the National Rifle Association and formed the club. 
Course, the kids just ate that up. Why, they even get certificates to show how they do on the range. Right now, it's time for some of the older members to try out what they've been learning. They spent a lot of hours making dry runs before they ever got a chance at the firing line, so they really know what they're up to, all right. They can climb into a sling and take up a prone position with the best of them. Well, look here. He's asking, can I get in? Well, now, don't give up, Dave. Maybe later. Meantime, Colonel Bartlett of the Air Force and his boy Robin make a nice team. Now look, son. Squeeze. All right, now, let's give it a try. Hey, watch that coontail, buddy. You get fuzz in your eye. Everything's cooking along just fine until, uh-oh, <laughs> there's that youngin' again. Ah, buck up, Davy. The third time's a charm. Maybe your buddy, Judy Blackburn, he'll slip in a good word for you. Now what you do, Sonny, you just aim for the little black dot. Oh, like that, you mean? Well, that's pretty good shooting anyway. Uh, hey, wait a minute, hold on. Atta boy, baby, I knew you'd do it. There you go, kiddies. A happy ending that winds up with a big... Now, this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your Army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.